You know, as I look around this room this morning, right, it looks as if this room is filled with what I would say some educated people, right? Some might say you aren't the brightest bunch, but I would have to disagree with Elder Gary on that statement. But in all seriousness, right, I look around this room, right, I, I'm, I'm looking, I'm trying to make eye contact with you guys, and, you know, I do believe that I see people who I would consider to be well-educated. I, I look around and I see people who would have, who would be considered to have a good head on their shoulders and just some overall decent human beings. And hopefully, no one disagrees with that statement. But the more that I think about it, you know, when I think about our congregation, when I think of us together collectively as a body of Christ, I do believe that we are pretty well versed when it comes to understanding scripture. I believe that we are fairly capable of studying scripture, and I think we do a good job of implementing scripture to our lives as it pertains to living for the kingdom of God. Would you agree with that statement? Amen, right? If you agree, your response should be amen. And so, for example, if I were to ask you to articulate the importance of Christmas as it pertains to our faith, I'm pretty confident that you could do a pretty good job, right? I believe that you and I individually and collectively together would do well to serve as a great witness to the testimony of the birth of Jesus Christ. If I were to ask you to explain the importance of the cross of Jesus and how Jesus being crucified for our sake is so foundational to our faith, I'm pretty sure that you would give a, a, a pretty solid answer. I believe that you would even impress Pastor Young He right, with your answers. That means that you and I would do well to serve as a testimony to the cross of Christ and everything that that entails. Even if I were to ask you to share the gospel, I'm confident that you could do that well. Some of you, you are doing that on a daily basis. But if we zoom in a little closer, and when it pertains to the resurrection... To be quite honest with you, I don't know how confident I am that we would do a good job of articulating the importance and the significance of the resurrection. Because when I think about it, the resurrection as it pertains to maybe our theology and our sound doctrine and our ability to articulate really the importance, aside from just saying that Jesus rose again, but understanding why that is so important to our faith, I don't know if we could... Do that well, like the other things that I listed. And, and judging by the stillness of everyone around us, I think it's safe to say that you would agree with me, right? Because, you know, when it pertains to the resurrection, how would you explain its significance beyond Jesus overcame death because he rose again? You know, it, like, odd thought here, a side note, it's kind of odd that we're talking about the resurrection as we are in the season of Advent, right? It's kind of weird. We're, we're, talking, we're talking about Jesus' death and resurrection, and we haven't even celebrated his birth yet, all right? But the thing is that what we need to understand about the resurrection and its significance, why, why it's important, is because I do believe, and you, many of you would agree with me, that our theology surrounding the resurrection is something that is a core foundation to our faith. Because to, make, to, put, to put it simply, right, if the resurrection never happened, I believe that that would be something that would be extremely detrimental to our faith and the credibility of our faith because, in all honesty, we affirm, we believe that the resurrection did happen. And that's what you would say, okay, just make sure we're on the same page, right? right we, we, we believe that the resurrection happened, right? We, we affirm it, we confess, we confess it, and our faith is made complete in and through the completed work of Jesus with his life, with his death, and even his what? Resurrection, right? It is the completion of Jesus' work, right? It is the completion of God's will that he sent his one and only son to live out and accomplish. And John, or for John, according to his gospel and what he's trying to communicate to whoever might read his account is that this, the cross serves as a symbolism of victory and redemption for us. Right, we see the cross, right? The cross is meant to be something that was meant to be humiliation, 
Right? The cross was something that was meant to stop this movement known as Christianity or the gospel. But for us as the church, the victory serves as victory and redemption. Why? Because Jesus was not defeated in death. He was resurrected in life. And so when we see the cross, when we see an empty tomb, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for us as a church to our faith, that serves as a fruit that comes from a victorious cross, from a victorious Jesus. Amen? And so our thinking about the resurrection is something that shouldn't be limited or even minimized. But we as a church should continually hold a high view of the resurrection, right, as it serves as a significant piece to the very foundation of our faith. Because at the end of the day, as our lives serve as a testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of our Savior isn't something that should be ne- neglected or even or m- omitted, but should continually serve as an essential piece of information and truth to who we are in faith as a people of God. Why? Why is the resurrection so important? Because in your growing faith, right, your life will continually serve as a testimony not only to the life and death of Jesus Christ, but also his resurrection. Right? Your life will be a living testimony to how Christ has been victorious over your sin in your own life. And your life will continually serve as a living testimony to how Jesus has redeemed you how you have been welcomed into the kingdom of God, and how your life will continually serve as fruits to that very victorious cross. Right? Does it make sense? See, this is all building you up so that you could be used by God. Right? All of this is building you up so that you could be restored, so that as you're being redeemed, that you could be ultimately be sent out for the kingdom of God. Because for us as a church, as it pertains to the foundation of our faith, Because Christ has been raised from the dead, because of the faith that you have in Jesus, you have been raised as well. We can't be raised with Christ if we don't believe that he was raised as well. We cannot be resurrected from death into life if we believe the resurrection never happened or if the resurrection doesn't hold a significant place in our hearts, more importantly, our faith. Because we are raised to life with him because of him, right? Does it make sense? And so how can faith be born out of the resurrection? How can faith grow as a result of Jesus being raised from the dead? Because as we see in our scripture this morning and in the coming weeks as we look to see how Jesus just keeps showing up after death in his resurrected self, we will see that faith is something that doesn't Autumn is, is something that's not automatically connected to the resurrection. But faith is something that can happen as a result of the resurrection and something that kind of unfolds and happens over a, a period of time and experiences. Because in death, right, it looks as if, uh, as if faith is defeated and that faith is lost, but it is with the resurrection that faith and even hope are resurrected as well. You see, in, in a moment that was dark, in a moment that felt like there was, that everything had ended, right? It is in Jesus' resurrection that new life begins. New life is possible. And even for the disciples and all of those who had followed Jesus in their defeated self, it is Jesus showing up in his resurrected self that gives them a new life, a new sense of hope, and even a new sense of urgency that they see fit to go and tell forth of not only a Jesus who was crucified, but also a Jesus who has been resurrected. Right? It is through the resurrection that our faith is resurrected and sent forth to be a witness to everything that Jesus has done and everything that Jesus is doing in your life. 
And so when we think about all that, when we think about the calling that is placed on our lives to be a witness to not only the life of Jesus, not only to the death of Jesus, but to the resurrection of Jesus, I do believe that as Jesus meets us and encounters us and confronts us, that he is not only redeeming and restoring us, but he is preparing us to be sent forth and to be used for his kingdom. Can I, is that amen? Yes? All right. And so when we think about that, there are three things, three things to prayerfully consider this morning as you and I are being called to be a witness to the very resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first thing is this, as it pertains to being a witness to the testimony of the resurrection, you and I need to be passionate about Jesus' love because you have experienced it, right? We, as a people, we as individuals need to be passionate passionate about Jesus' love, right? We need to be, and it's not limited to just Jesus' love. We need to be passionate about Jesus' grace. We need to be passionate about Jesus' mercy. We need to be passionate about Jesus' forgiveness. Why? Because you have experience it. Not only have you heard of it, not only have you heard people speak of it, not only have you witnessed it in the lives of other people, but you and I are being raised up to be passionate people because you have been on the receiving end. Your life has changed, or your life is changing because you are receiving it. You see, more than anything, our faith is cultivated and matured through our experiences with Jesus. In other words, the more that you interact with Jesus, the more that you're going to experience him. And the more that you experience him, the more is is your life going to be changed and transformed for his greater purpose. And that is to be what? A, A testimony. A living testimony. A walking testimony to the very things that Jesus has done and accomplished in your life. or In your life and the person that you are becoming as a result of the life, the death, and the resurrection, the gospel are affirming. Or living examples that God is truly a living God and still moving and working today. Right? Because the more that we interact and experience what Jesus has to give, well, guess what? You are going to mature more. You are going to grow more spiritually. You are going to be molded into a, what I would like to think as a better person who is equipped to live for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, at this particular moment in scripture, we actually have three different encounters or three people who encounter uh, what is essentially an empty tomb differently. Each person has their own reaction to what they see. With Mary Magdalene, right, she was the first on the scene, according to many scripture accounts. And to say she's emotional is an understatement, right? She's panicking. She's weeping. She's like, man, they stole Jesus. Where have they taken him? So she freaks out and she goes over to Simon Peter and to John and tells them, like, hey, Jesus is missing. They have taken him. And so Simon Peter and John race. And I don't know why, but it's important, but John makes, it a, makes a point to say that it was a close race. But John was the faster of the disciples, all right? I think that's funny, right? There's a bunch of dudes being guys, right? That, that, that John will take the opportunity in verse 4 to write, you know, both of them are running, but the other disciple outran Peter. Right? It's funny that John is like, that's probably an ongoing joke that they had going for, for, for many years, right, of how John beat Peter in a foot race. But that's besides the point, right? But what we need to understand is we need to think about like, these people and, and the, the life that they have lived or how they have interacted or how they've experienced Jesus, right? Think about how Mary Magdalene, the apostle John, and Peter experienced the love of Christ as they continually followed Jesus. So what do we know about Mary Magdalene? Right? What do we know about her? Right? Scripture tells us that she was a woman who followed Jesus and traveled with Jesus, Scripture it, it, it makes a note to tell us that she supported Jesus' ministry using her own resources. Right? And what we see through Mary Magdalene is dedication and commitment to Jesus and his ministry. Or we see how she's passionate about living for Jesus. But what Scripture also tells us about Mary Magdalene is that she had not one, not two, not three, but a total of seven demons casted out from her. 
And that's not something to make light of. And the way that I understand that is that, man, like to have seven demons casted out of you means that you have done some things, you have seen some things. It also means that you have experienced a, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, anger, and even bitterness. And even yet the love of Christ meets her, confronts her, and changes her. And so for us, Mary Magdalene serves as a, sim a symbolism to those who have received Jesus' grace or those who long to experience Jesus but feel disqualified. She's symbolic to those who would feel unworthy of Jesus' love. And her interaction, her experience with Jesus speaks that Jesus' love reaches even a sinner like hers. And then we have someone like Simon Peter who will go on to do great things for the church, right? He does great uh, many things and when it comes to building the early church. But before we get to that point, we see Simon Peter to do what? Deny Jesus not once, not twice, but three times, right? And later in the Gospel of John, in Gospel, Gospel of John chapter 21, we see his interacting, interaction with Jesus being accompanied with much grace, mercy, love, and even forgiveness. And so Peter is, is significant because he serves as a testimony to the resurrection, but also because of how he has experienced the forgiveness of Christ and in that reconciliation being sent forth to be used continually for the kingdom of God despite his history, right? And we see what life looks like in the present living right, under the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, John, Mary, and Peter all have their fair share of, of baggages. They, they all have their fair share of, of faults and imperfections, but because of how they've experienced Jesus and how Jesus' love has transcended over their lives, they serve as a witness to the resurrection despite not fully understanding it at that time. It didn't stop them. Right? And a lot of times we think our disbelief prevents us from being used or prevents us from being met with Jesus Christ. But that is beyond the case and we'll get to that a little bit later. You see, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, John writes this about the love of Jesus. He says, a real love for others will chase those worries away. The thought of being punished is what makes us afraid. It shows we have not really learned to what? To love. You see, John writes this within the same breath as understanding what God's, that John writes this within the same breath as understanding that God is love and how we are to testify about that love. But it comes from a place of first experiencing it. Right? Yes, you need to testify of God's love. But who brings a more convincing argument? Somebody who's experienced it or somebody who's only read it? Read it? Right? Who brings a more convincing argument? Somebody who is living because of it or somebody who overheard it? from somebody else. And so we have to ask the question. We need to ask ourselves the question. Well, how have you experienced the love of Christ? Or how have you experienced the love of Christ? How have you experienced Jesus' forgiveness? How have you experienced or how do you experience his grace and his mercy? And whatever your answer is, right, whatever your answer is, that experience is meant to change you. It is meant to transform you. It is meant to affirm that you are truly loved by God, that you are forgiven by God, and that you are a recipient of his grace and in his mercy. And that is meant to equip you so that you can be used by God to testify of the great things that he has done, even in a sinner's life like yours and mine. But we have been called to be passionate about God's love, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, because we have experienced it. Right? It's kind of like those commercials, the hair club for men. I don't know if you guys remember those commercials. Right? And the person that would come up talking about like how he, he used to be bald, but he's not that bald anymore. Right? He would also say, I'm not, I'm not only the president, but I'm also a client. Right? He, meaning that he was, he, was, he was giving his testimony about how great the product was, not because he was trying to sell it, but because it worked on him first. And when we think about the love of Christ, right, we testify of it, not because we're trying to sell it, 
Not because we're trying to draw people in, but we are speaking from a place that we have experienced and our lives have been truly changed. And I desire nothing less than to see your life changed as well as a result of God's love. Does that make sense? You see, your experiences with Christ from his love to his forgiveness to being used by him for his kingdom and his purposes, despite your shortcomings, is meant to be shared. Right? The world doesn't need perfect people to testify about a perfect Christ. The world needs broken people who have been restored by Christ to tell that story. Right? The world needs people who are being healed from their iniquities to speak about a resurrected Christ, a victorious Christ. Right? You don't need to be perfect. The world doesn't need to hear from perfect people. The world needs to hear from like-minded people, from familiar people, people that we can resonate with, people who are tangible and relatable. You see, we need to be a people who are passionate about Jesus' love. And that happens through our sharing of stories, our testimonies. It comes from being a little bit vulnerable to talk about our, our, our mishaps. But we do so so that God can be glorified. We do so so that God can be magnified. We do that so that the love of Christ can be known. And for the person that is hearing of it can say, you know what? I think the love of Christ can be for me as well. You know what? He died for me. As well, he lived for me as well. He resurrected for me as well. But that happens because people like you and myself are passionate about his love because we are experiencing it. We're talking from a place where it has changed us first and we wish to share that with one another. The second thing is this. In order to be a witness to the resurrection, we need to be a people who can firmly grasp the words of the resurrection. Right? Note, notice that I'm not saying like we need to be a people who can fully understand it, run with it, and articulate it, and, and write a, a dissertation or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we need to be a people who can firmly hold on to the words of the, rex, the words, words of the resurrection despite fully understanding it. You know, the resurrection of Jesus is not something that should serve as a surprise because Jesus has been talking about it, right? And Jesus has mentioned it to disciples, and yet they didn't firmly grasp what he was saying. They, they, they listened to him, but they didn't hear him, right? They, they, were, they were hearing him, but they, they weren't hearing him, you know? Jesus has said things like, I am the resurrection and the life. Right? He has said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Jesus has said things that about going to be with the Father. And Jesus has said things like, now you see me, now you don't. Right? That's my translation, by the way. But in verse 9, right, of today's passage, John kind of gives us a little bit of clarity. Right? He says, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Granted, remember, like, we're talking about the disciples. We're talking about the people who are walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, spend every living moment with Jesus up until the point that he was given over to be crucified. The resurrection the news of it or the plans of it is not new, but they didn't quite understand it. And so one thing we have to understand is that firmly grasping, at least the way that I understand it, takes time. Firmly understanding something takes time. Like you can kind of get it instantly, but to fully understand it, it's going to take time. And given the 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 the, the, the the society that we live in in today's day and age is like we are so quick to see results or we are so quick to listen, yet we are so slow, right, to give a, the opportunity to make sense. And as a result, we are so quick to run off and think that we know what we are doing. But the flip side of not being able to fully understand something immediately can leave us feeling discouraged, can make us feel like we're a little, we're a little dumb, right, if I'm speaking honestly here. But what you have to understand is that what God teaches and leaves us with is something that will not always quit, click automatically, right? It's going to take time. Think of all the countless scriptures that you have read that didn't make sense today but made sense weeks, years from now, right? We, we, we can speak from our own experience. But the thing that we have to understand is that even though it takes time, we can't be discouraged because it's taking time. 
Sometimes it takes life experiences to better understand what Christ is saying. Sometimes it takes living life that helps bring the word of God into a better perspective. You see, we got to give opportunity for that to happen. Firmly grasp means like, okay, I'm listening. Okay, God, uh, help me better understand this. And as we're doing so, we need to leave room for the Holy Spirit to help us gain a better understanding. But here's the thing. right? When we don't firmly grasp or gain a sound understanding, when we're not trying to, when we're not putting forth an effort to do so, it becomes extremely difficult to recognize what God is doing in that particular moment, what God is up to in that particular season. It becomes extremely difficult to recognize what God is doing right before our very own eyes. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you just throw it away. You take it with you. You wrestle with it. But think about it. As John reflects on this moment, as of what is happening, they didn't quite get it. Right? Jesus had given them all the clues. It was right there before their very own eyes, and yet they missed it. But it took time. It took reflecting. It took other moments and interactions with Jesus for, the, for it to click and to make sense. It even took witnessing someone else interact with Jesus as he stuck his fingers through his holes. Like, oh, dang, that's a real, that's a real thing. Right? And I'm speaking of Thomas, by the way. It took even moments like that to, better, to establish a better grasp of what Jesus meant. You see, John makes a record of Jesus' interaction with Peter as Peter was being reconciled. But that moment was for Peter, but for John witnessing it, that helped him better understand the love and the mercy that Jesus had in laying down his life. But that comes moments later through, what? Reflection. Remember, John writes this gospel at the very tail end of his life. Even though Jesus said all those things, it started to click more and more as he lived life, as he was better to understand the things that were going on around him. It made more sense. All right, to put it into a better perspective for you, last night I was having dinner with uh, some friends and, and we we're talking and our conversation started to take a turn for really, really serious, right, out, out of nowhere. And one of my friends started reflecting on these conversations and these fights that he had with his dad. Like his dad was warning him about dating a certain girl. Right? His dad was waiting, uh, warning him about what life would be like if you were to marry somebody who had kids from a, from a previous relationship and all that stuff. And at the time, it made him mad, it made him angry. But it wasn't until his dad passed away. And it wasn't until he, started, he had his, own, his, his own, own marriage and his own kid that he began to better understand the things that his dad was warning about. And so his bitterness and his anger slowly changed into an understanding. He could start to see what it was that his dad was trying to communicate to him. And granted that his dad didn't do the greatest job communicating it to him. But the point that I'm making is that with time, with life experiences, with the world moving around you, it adds perspective and it gives us a lens to look into the things that people are trying to tell us out of love. And the same thing happens with the words of God. The same thing goes for the things that Christ is calling for you to do, the things that is required of you as a follower of Christ. At the time, it, seems, it might seem absurd. It might seem ridiculous. But as you have lived life firmly grasping onto the things that God has said, it starts to make sense. You may not fully understand the things that Christ is speaking to you or the things that Christ desires of you today. But I promise you that if you firmly grasp onto the things that God has said, you will gain a better understanding as you hold on to it, continually living this life with the glory of God. You see, in Luke, there's another instance after the resurrection where Jesus appears to these two dudes on the road to Emmaus. Right, you have right, you have these two individuals, and, and they're they're talking about all the things that have transpired from the from Jesus being from the people shouting Hosanna, from Jesus being handed over to be crucified, from Jesus dying, and, and from the tomb being empty. Right, they're talking about all these things. They're like, can you believe it, man? Like this, this is crazy. What's going on right now? And some dude just shows up next to him and goes, "Hey, man, what y'all talking about?" 
right? If you know the story, obviously this is a little different than what you might read opposed to how I'm telling you. Right? But Jesus appears to these individuals and says, hey, man, what y'all hey, talking about, man? That sounds interesting. And so what they do is that they, they, don't, they see Jesus, but they don't know it's Jesus, and they start to explain all the things that happened to Jesus. But it wasn't until Jesus takes bread, blesses it, and breaks it that they, res- that they recognize that it was a resurrected Jesus who was with them. It clicked. But as life was happening, it made sense. In that moment, they didn't fully understand it. In that moment, they didn't fully grasp what was happening. But they held on to the words of Christ so that as it was happening before them, as something familiar, something that was tangible to the, to the, to the Jesus that they knew happened, that light bulb goes off. And so what we see in Luke 24, 32, we see the reaction after Jesus just magically disappears, right? You know, now you see me, now you don't, right? In Luke chapter 24, verse 32, this is what they said. They looked to each other. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? At the time, like, they didn't know what was going on, but something was happening. God's word was working. Right? And for us, like, we, we, not, we, not, we may not fully understand the things that are happening in real time. But that doesn't mean God's word isn't working. It is important for you and for myself to continually and firmly grasp his words. So, that, so as it is closer to us rather than further away from us, that we're able to comprehend and better understand as we are living life. You see, even though they didn't know it was Jesus, even when they didn't believe, right, he was risen from the dead, their hearts still burned because of the ministry of God's word and of Jesus' living word, right? God's word can have the same, the same effect on our hearts even when we don't know that it is Jesus doing that work. But that can only happen when we firmly hold on to the words of Christ and take them with us because over time, it will make more sense. It will make greater sense. And that will aid us as we continue to testify about the, resurrect, about the resurrected Jesus. Amen? The last thing is this. And we'll wrap things up this morning. The third thing that we need to do, or we need to think about, or we need to consider is that we need Jesus' grace or Jesus' love, Jesus' mercy, everything that Jesus is to confront us and convict us. Right, we need Jesus' grace to confront us and then to convict us. You know, when, when we look at the reaction from the disciples, like to be honest with you, at first glance, it seems a little anticlimactic. Right, because verse 10 tells us that their response after examining the tomb, looking at everything, about Mary Magdalene being dramatic and so forth. You know what they do afterwards? Scripture says... They just go home. That's it? Is that all? all right, I'm out of here. But, you know, going home in and of itself feels more significant the more that you think about it. To put it into a better perspective, right, we, we go to church on Sundays, the majority of us, right, we show up here on Sundays. And what do we do? We, we hear a message pertaining to the gospel, and then what happens after that? You might, you might spend a few minutes out in the lobby. You might eat uh, some food. You might eat some donuts. You might have a conversation. And after that, you are on your way home. Is that it? You just come here, you just eat, and you go home, and that's it, and then just kind of forget about everything? I would hope not. Right? At least the goal, the intention for us should be that we would come here on a Sunday, that we would hear the, the, a message from the Lord, that we would sing our praises, that we would give our thanks and our offerings, that we would have fellowship, that God would be honored and glorified, and that as we would go home, we would take all those things that we have experienced, all those things that we have gained, take them home with us, sit with them, reflect on them, and from there be con- convicted go you see the, the goal is that you would that as you go home that you would take Jesus and the things surrounding Jesus and the gospel your experiences with Jesus and from there that it would rest on your our hearts as we continue to live our lives at home through our jobs and through our community because the reality of the situation is this that when you go home life doesn't stop 
But life continues. Right? That when you go home, life, life continues to happen. Right? Because I don't know about you, but when I go home, I reflect. I think about, I think about the day. Do you? Or do you go home, do you go home and you shut off and you're just a zombie? I don't think so. Some of you go home and, and, and you're like, man, something's bothering you from work. And you're thinking about that. You're replaying that situation all over in your head. Some of you, maybe you got, you got an argument with somebody, I don't know, out, out, in, out in the neighborhood, right? You think about that, right? You reflect on like, oh, like, what did I say when I was wrong? Or, I can't believe that he or she would say that to me. Right? Do you not sit on those things and replay those moments all over again? I would imagine that for you, that as you hear the word of God and as, as, as our pastors are, are, are not only trying to uplift you but trying to challenge you, that you would be processing those things in your homes. Because at home, life happens. At home is where you gather your thoughts and get ready for the next day. Like at home is where you, you grow old, right? It's where you take the things we've experienced outside from the house and think of how can I do better? What did I do wrong? You see, Jesus' grace and love not only confronts us here at church during a sermon, but I believe that, you know, as you receive a benediction, that the Holy Spirit takes that and continues to confront us, in a, even in our cars, as we're driving home, as we're sitting in, 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 our, in our homes or sitting at certain other, other rooms of the house, right? You see, the goal is to be confronted by God. And the next step is to be convicted to go do something with it. You see, if, if experience is necessary to be a witness, then we need to be confronted. We need to encounter the resurrected Christ and have this conviction that we are to be a witness to the resurrection. I don't, I don't think the disciples left that day and went home defeated. I think they went home and they're trying to process what's going on. He's like, man, you're not going to believe what happened today. You can't, you're not going to believe what we, what we saw, what we didn't see. Right, we were expecting to see, a, you know, the tomb, but we looked in him as the cold, clothes was folded, right? Like it, it, something's just off. Something's happening, and I just don't know what it is. That is being confronted. That leads to being convicted. And one thing that we see in the beauty of all of this is that the empty tomb Jesus doesn't remain hidden, right? As Scripture tells us, as we will see in, in the later days to come, Jesus continually revealed his resurrected self and met people where they were, from confronting Mary Magdalene outside the tomb to showing up to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus to even entering the upper room when all the, room, all the doors were closed. Right? We can even say that the resurrected Jesus confronts Paul on the Damascus Road. But here's the thing, church. Like, we are being called to be a witness to the resurrection. You and I are supposed to live and be a living testimony to the victorious Jesus that we so love and so passionate about. You see, even in their doubting, Jesus shows up and confronts them. Even in their disbelief, Jesus shows up and confronts them, even in their discouragement, even when they're feeling at maybe like rock bottom, Jesus meets them where they are. He confronts them, and from there they are convicted, and they go forward living for the gospel, testifying of all that Jesus has done. That should, that should be something that's encouraging to us. Right? God's not calling you forth because you're a biblical scholar. God is not calling you forth because you're able to re re recite all these passages in, in every conversation. No, but God is, convic God is confronting you, convicting you, and sending you forth because you've met him, because you've experienced him, because your life has changed as a result of him, that you are not you because of your own works, but you are now you because of his completed works. And so for us, the goal, the challenge is this. If we look at what the prophet Isaiah tells the people of Israel, he says this in Isaiah 55, 6. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And so 
my conviction reading that and understanding that is that now is the time to seek the Lord. Now is the time to seek the Lord. Today is a great day to seek him and to call upon him. Today is a great day to experience more of his love, more of his mercy, more of his grace, more of his, con- of, of his forgiveness. Like why are we so can- content with experiencing Christ 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when there is more to experience of him today, when we, yet we are so reluctant, we are so okay with what has already happened, when God is calling you forth to experience even more of him so that he can raise you up and send you out because even though you Maybe you have reached some people already. God is raising you up today so that you can reach some more people, so that you can be a living testimony. Because I'm looking around this room and no one is walking dead. You're walking in life so that you may continually be a witness to the great and amazing things that Jesus is and has done in your life. I think it's great. I think it's amazing that you can share with me a testimony from 10, 15, 20 years ago. That's amazing. But what testimony can you share with me that has happened in the past year? What testimony can you share with me about how God is, has got, you've experienced God during a season of COVID, of being separated and segregated and locked up in your house? Can you tell me a, a, a testimony of how God met you in the solitude of your home and, man, you were convicted? Can you share a story like that? Seek him while he still may be found. You see, Jesus has revealed himself as a resurrected Christ so that you and I could continually experience a living hope that we would be confronted by his amazing grace and that we be- that, and so that we could better understand his words and his calling in our lives. Why? Because he's not done with you yet. God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. You still have a job to complete, you still have a cook calling to fulfill. Because as you have, as Christ has been resurrected from the grave, you too have been resurrected into life so that you would go forth and be a vocal piece, a living testimony, pointing not to yourself, but to our great God who continues to reign today. Amen? Amen. Let us pray.